So can a space station be so powerful it can blow itself up? It seems almost inevitable. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So today I'm going to talk about a movie I've wanted to talk about for a very long time. The movie is Star Wars A New Hope. One of the things that's key to understanding the Star Wars films is that Star Wars is really not science fiction. Now, before you fill the uh, space below with lots of negative comments, what I mean is that Star Wars isn't really a science fiction film. It's a fantasy film with science fiction trappings. Think about the first movie. An evil wizard kidnaps a beautiful princess and hides her away in his impregnable fortress. Then a farm boy, an ancient wizard, two servants, and two pirates break into the fortress, rescue the beautiful princess, rally the townspeople, and destroy the impregnable fortress, but the evil wizard escapes to fight another day. This is a classic tale. This could be from anything written in the last 2,000 years. And Star Wars is built on such things as classic storytelling. It is built on familiar movie tropes. It is built on references to the decades of film war that preceded it. And so it tells these stories in familiar ways. And so it's really not fair to analyze it. There's just so much that it does that makes sense to our sense of movie tropes and fantasy films, but wouldn't make sense in a science fiction context. Spaceships do not make U-turns. Psychic abilities cannot go instantaneously across millions of light years. There is no sound in space and so on. Those are familiar concepts. Those are familiar cliches. We've gone over them in other videos. In this one, I wanna do something a little different with this film. I want to talk about some of the things that Star Wars got a little bit right and maybe some of the stuff it got a little bit wrong. Maybe look at it from a different angle. So I think you'll be clear once I get into it. So this is something I just noticed as I was preparing for this video. The very first shot of Star Wars is wrong. The moons here are, you're seeing them in sort of a half phase or maybe a waxing gibbous phase, whereas you see the surface of Tatooine completely illuminated. Those are illuminated by the suns of Tatooine, and so the light should be coming from the same direction, so they should all be in the same phase. Tatooine should look half light and half dark here, not completely illuminated. So right off the bat, we're getting some science wrong. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single shot like this. Just most of them. So this is one of the most famous shots of movie history, obviously. And Tatooine has two suns. Now, this is a very realistic thing. There are binary stars in the universe. In fact, most of the stars in our galaxy are probably binaries or triple systems or even higher. Uh, we've done know this based on surveys of stars, usually too so close together that they look like one star in the telescope. But most of the stars in the universe are binaries. Now, can a planet survive around a binary star? The answer, surprisingly, is yes. Usually when you have three bodies interacting gravitationally, that is not a stable system. And eventually one of the bodies, usually the lowest mass body, will be kicked out of the system. However, the, with a binary star system, you can have planets that are in stable orbits around them. You can either have the two stars very close together, and then the it's what we call a circumbinary planet. The planet's way out there, so sort of orbiting around the two of them as though they were one mass. Or you could have two stars separated by a long distance and have the planets pretty close in so that the main gravity they're responding to is just the star they're closest to. Now, I actually pulled down the novelization of this book uh, that's just written by George Lucas, and he actually seems to have done some research. He specifies the two stars in the Tatooine system are G-type stars. G1, G2. The sun is a G5, so these are stars very similar to our own main sequence stars. They are very close together. He specifies that Tatooine is very far out, so he specifically says in the novel, and it's shown in the movies, we always see the two stars close to each other, and so Tatooine must be this circumbinary planet orbiting around those. Now, it's a little close, so that's why it's hot. 
It could also be that you get a little bit of perturbation because you still have a three body system. So maybe Tatooine was more habitable in the past and moved a little closer and got a little hotter. But yes, you can absolutely have planets orbiting around binary stars. And in fact, since this movie was made, we have found planets orbiting around binary stars. We know that they exist. We know that some of them can be in the habitable zone. And so this is uh, uh, not only realistic at the time, but has grown more realistic over the last 45 years now that we know more about planets outside of our solar system. When this movie was made, the number of planets we knew outside of our solar system was... Zero. We now know about thousands outside of our solar system. And I'll talk about this more as we go on, not only through this movie, but through this series. We have found that our solar system is not really representative of the kind of solar systems that are out there. There is a massive variety of planets and planetary systems that are out there. And so this is one of the things that the movie did get right. And one of the ways in which George Lucas kind of was a visionary in seeing that you could have planets outside of our solar system that were radically different from each other, that were radically different from anything in our solar system, that you could have infinite variety. I mean, he was doing these for visual things and so forth, but you can actually have these. You could have a Tatooine out there. It's absolutely realistic. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. Yes, indeed. If it's a fast ship. A fast ship? You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. Okay, this is one of the most famous things in science fiction uh, history of Han saying that it's the ship that made the Kessel Run less than 12 parsecs. Parsecs are a measure of distance, not of time. Now, this has been retconned in two ways. Lucas has said that maybe this was Han Solo just sort of talking smack and not really knowing what he was talking and just trying to impress them by throwing out words. In the movie Solo, it was retconned that the Kessel Run was sort of a race and he found a shortcut through some other region of space. Fine. Either one of those uh, can work on here. But I did want to take a second to explain what exactly a parsec is. One of the most difficult things to measure in astronomy is distance. We don't get to send tape measures out there. We don't get to bounce radio signals off of distant stars. We have a variety of ways we use to measure distance. Now, the most direct way is through something called parallax. Now, you can demonstrate this by covering one eye. Don't worry, no one's looking. Hold it up and cover me up with your thumb. And now switch to the other eye and you'll see your thumb moves or appears to move. It's covering a different area. It, it, with one eye, it's on top of me. With one eye, it's on the other. That's a difference between the way your two eyes, they look at your thumb at different angles. Now, if you knew the distance between your two eyes and you measured the angle that your thumb shifts over, you could measure through simple calculation the length of your arm. This is called triangulation. You do this every day. Your brain, because it knows the distance between your two eyes from years and years of experience, can, that's how you get depth perception, that you can see something's far away, you can see something's close. You get that three-dimensional perception because of the difference between your two eyes and your brain automatically doing those calculations based on how the two images that come into your eyes. The way we use this in astronomy is to measure the distance to nearby stars. We look at a nearby star, we see what distant stars it lines up with, and then what do we do? We wait for six months. The Earth moves around the sun and the angle to that star changes slightly. And so the star appears to shift a little bit relative to the background stars. This is called parallax. This is the way we met, the first way we were ever able to measure distances in astronomy. Astronomer Tycho Bray was not able to measure this and was one of the reasons he rejected the idea that the Earth moves around the sun. Because if the Earth moves around the sun, you should measure that parallax. You should measure the shift in the stars. Now it turned out the stars are so far away that shift is tiny. The nearest star has a shift of less than one arc second, which is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. You, we needed really precise telescopes to be able to measure that. But even to this day, this is we do this. The most important mission you may even ever have heard of is the Gaia mission, which measured extremely precise positions for millions of stars and has revolutionized a lot of branches of astronomy. Now, what does this have to do with parsecs? For a long time, we didn't know exactly how far the Earth was away from the Sun. So that baseline we were using to measure those distances to those distant stars had a little bit of uncertainty in it. 
And so what we devised was a measure of distance that scaled to the solar system. What is a parsec? A parsec is exactly 206,265 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Or how much far away a star would be to have exactly one arc second of parallax, one 3,600th of a degree. What parsecs do, and the reason professionals use parsecs and not light years, is it scales the entire universe to something we can measure locally. We can measure the distance to the sun. We've done it in direct ways in the 19th century and the 20th century. We can bounce radar signals off it. We can measure it directly. By using parsecs, we scale everything to that Earth-Sun distance, to something real. And that becomes the basis for how we measure everything in the universe. And so parsecs are very important to astronomy. They have a long history. They are very connected to this. And so Han Solo is just sort of rattling off at the mouth here, but they are actually very interesting. Probably wouldn't be used in the Star Wars universe because they're very specific to Earth. You'd probably use light years. But uh, I, I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about that. Commence primary ignition. Would it be possible to destroy a planet like this? Probably not. When you, If you want to destroy a planet, you basically have to inject enough energy into it to separate all the par particles of it. Gravity binds planets together. And you can actually calculate how much binding energy is holding a planet together, and therefore how much energy you would need to liberate those that piece of that planet and blow it apart so it would never come back together again. And when you do that calculation for a planet that's maybe the size of the Earth, you find that you would need the entire output of the sun for a week to generate that kind of energy. Now, the Death Star is very small. It's the size of a small moon. How would you generate that? You shouldn't certainly couldn't generate it from chemical energy or anything like that. You could potentially have something like antimatter. You, if you've ever seen the famous equation E equals mc squared, that's energy mass equivalence. That if you were to convert mass into energy, E equals mc squared how, it tells you how much energy you would get. Antimatter is matter that is like matter, but has opposite charge. If antimatter and matter meet, they collide and are converted directly into energy. Where this is relevant is if you were to combine matter and antimatter, you convert all of the mass into energy. With nuclear processes, you only convert a tiny percentage into energy. With antimatter, you convert all of it. How much energy? If this book were made of antimatter and I set it on the table, it would release a more energy than a thermonuclear bomb. If this Death Star were powered by antimatter, you could generate potentially enough energy to destroy a planet like this. And it doesn't have to be antimatter. It could be vacuum energy. It could be some other form of energy. There are potential theories that could generate that amount of energy. However, the problem is you're needing to shoot this down a laser in a span of a matter of seconds. During that time, the energy density of the laser is hotter than the core of the sun. Many, many millions of times hotter than the core of the sun. So that energy would destroy the Death Star while it were doing it. I mean, it's a science fiction movie. Again, Lucas is going on tropes and movie ideas and things from classical mythology and so forth. So I understand why he did it. If you were writing this as a science fiction film, you probably wouldn't do this. Probably what you would do is you would drop an asteroid on the planet, uh, a very large asteroid. We talked about the, how asteroids can destroy planets before. It wouldn't destroy the planet, but it would make it uninhabitable. There are other things you could do to do this. If this were a science fiction movie, for a fantasy movie, it's fine. But I just thought I'd talk about the, fan, the science aspects of this. planet at maximum velocity. The moon with the rebel base will be in range in 30 minutes. So I really like this part. It's one of the ways in which Star Wars was visionary. When this movie was made, this was pre-Voyager. We didn't know a lot about the moons in our solar system. We knew a little bit and suspected a lot more. But as time has gone on, we've learned more about them. And our solar system has a wide variety of moons, particularly the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. The four inner moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are almost like little worlds. Io is volcanic. Europa uh, and Ganymede and Callisto have lots of ice and, and possibly liquid water under the surface, and so on. Now, why is that relevant? Imagine if you took Jupiter and moved it much closer to the sun. 
all the ice on those moons melts. They become watery. Now, I don't know how much of their atmosphere they would be able to hold on to or how much that water they would be able to hold on to. That would depend on magnetic fields and gravity and, and so forth. It's very complicated. But those could potentially be habitable if Jupiter were close to the sun. Now, at the time this movie was made, we assume that would not be the case, that gas giants like Jupiter would be very far out from their sun, just like Jupiter is. But one of the first planets we ever discovered was a what we now call a hot Jupiter, a Jupiter-sized planet that is close to its sun, orbiting very close. And we have found Jupiter-sized planets that are inside the habitable zone. When this was discovered, I was a graduate student, and there was a talk given by Frank Drake, famous for the Drake equation, that motivated some of our searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. And he was asked what he thought about this new discovery. And he said, well, these hot Jupiters may not be inhabitable, but their moons might be. And I remember turning to one of the graduate students and saying, is he talking about Yavin or the forest moon of Endor? And he said, yeah, I think he is. We are getting to the point with the technology where we may be able to discover moons around extrasolar planets. We may get to the point, maybe it'll take a few decades, where we could detect what's, what the composition of those moons is. We're, we're starting to get to the point where we can detect what the composition of planets is. This is another place where Star Wars was incredibly visionary about the variety of planets and planetary systems we have out there. The scientific consensus at that time was a very staid one. Planetary systems, if they existed, would be very much like our solar system. Rocky planets on the inside, big Jupiter-like planets on the outside, and so forth. What we have discovered over the last two decades is that there is a huge variety out there and that the vision of Star Wars with habitable moons and gas giants and binary planets and all this stuff is way closer to reality than science was at the time. So it's some way that Lucas's imagination was better than what we knew from science. What? Theater cheered when this happened in my when I was a kid. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. So, is this scientifically feasible that you could blow up a powerful space station this way? We're really into fantasy era here, but I actually think this is not that unrealistic, given all the other assumptions going into this. Remember, the energy generated by the Death Star has to be gigantic for it to blow up a planet. Turning that even a fraction of that energy loose inside the Death Star itself would easily destroy it. Remember, the Death Star is the size of a small moon. It's blowing up planets. That's the kind of energy it's generating. So even a small fraction of that turned loose would do so. And there are historical precedents for this. During World War II, when bombs would penetrate to the uh, ammo supplies on battleships, they would explode and blow themselves up. Having a powerful energy like source like this and being able to trip some kind of exhaust system that causes it to release even a fraction of that energy inside the Death Star crosses me as realistic, given all the other assumptions that go into this. I'm not gonna review this as a movie. I obviously love Star Wars. Star Wars is a beloved classic. Uh, as a movie, it is fantastic. As for the science, I could spend all day going around how spaceships don't make U-turns and stuff like that, but I'm willing to suspend disbelief when a movie is good, and this is obviously, you know, a great movie, so I'm willing to suspend disbelief most of the time. But in terms of where it wanders into my house of science, being able to blow up planets, that's clearly in the fantasy realm. Uh, the force, clearly in a fantasy realm. Much of what goes on to clear in the fantasy realm, but the one thing it does get right is that our galaxy has a wide variety of planets. This is way ahead of its time of a vision of a galaxy that has lots of planets, that has habitable moons orbiting gas giants and so forth. Things we now either know are true or think are likely to be true. Whether the universe's team is teeming with life and especially intelligent life as the Star Wars universe envisions, we don't know yet. We haven't had any signs of intelligent life out there. Maybe one of these days I'll make a video about SETI. We have seen signs within our solar system that life, at least the beginnings of it, may not be that uncommon, but we're still learning a lot there. 
One of the many, many reasons why I think Star Wars has been as beloved and as enduring as it has been is because it is one of the few science fiction franchises that gives us a universe that it is as vast and as amazing and as exotic as the universe we actually inhabit. Our universe has stars that can change their brightness by a factor of 10 in a matter of hours. It has planets that have metallic hydrogen in their cores. It has moons that have hundreds of volcanoes or vast oceans of hydrocarbons. We live in an amazing universe and too many science fiction film franchises want to live in a small universe where Every solar system is like the sun. Every planet is like Earth. Every alien looks like humans. Star Wars is one of the few that says, no, let's have a vast universe, a massive universe, an exotic universe, an amazing universe. And that is one of the reasons why I think this franchise is so beloved. So hopefully we'll be back in another couple weeks. Uh, I might do another star, some more Star Wars films down the road as we get there. Until then... Hit that subscribe button. I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Uh, enjoy science. Enjoy science and movies. And thank you for watching.